Hey, um, hi. You're probably really confused. Which is, uh, fair. One sec, you're having a heart attack at least according to your records. And the next, you're sitting up in a hospital bed with a regular guy and a hopeful robot monitoring your vitals. First off, I'm Steven, uh, hi. A graduate student who wanted to personally make sure you're doing alright. As for your name, it was part of a corrupted data file. And that blank look you're giving me makes me think you don't remember it either. Probably a side effect of your, um, death. So yeah, you were, um, dead. Thankfully, you were wise enough to set up for one of those, uh, cryo-freeze things that were popular back in your era. You know, freeze your body when you die and wake up in the future. And, uh, congratulations, it worked. For, uh, you. Not really for anyone else. So I really hope you didn't have any family who had undergone the same procedure. The company that did your freezing went bankrupt decades ago. And most of those frozen corpses eventually thawed out due to lack of power, lack of money, or just lack of anyone really caring. Luckily for you, your canister was kept cool due to a mix of wrong paperwork, shuffling of responsibility, and honestly just really bad accounting. Until one day yours truly found you in a basement, and when I saw you, I knew I had my research project in the bag. It took a lot of work, but you're alive again and I'm set to get a nice lab job at any company I want. That all said, I'm not going to leave you in a lurch now that my research project is done. I made sure you'll be taken care of as you adapt to this future, especially because I'm going to give you a brief rundown of the things that happened in between your death and uh, today. So the world around the time you died was going through a bad time. The transition from legacy fuels to more sustainable sources of energy was badly mismanaged for a variety of reasons and a lack of forward thinking allowed climate change to take a hell of a toll on the planet. All this and more causing a ton of issues. Some minor, at least historically, like the Caucasus War, small-scale conflicts on the border between Europe and Asia over dwindling resources in the region, and some pretty major, like the stock market crunch that not only collapsed the United States economy, but rippled out to the already weakened European and Russian markets. These and many other issues caused a slow decline of these former superpowers and allowed the rise of others, such as China. At the time, the country had embraced a philosophy called Jinji imperialism, which saw the economic powerhouse gobble up a half a dozen Southeast Asian nations, making them first economic satellites and eventually politically annexed provinces. Now, this gobbling up wasn't uh, smooth, and China's early attempts of integration using homogenization programs only inflamed the problem. Soon, social movements were popping up in each of these provinces, as these former independent countries wished to maintain their cultural identity. To solve this problem, those in charge decided that the nation needed a new identity that can inflame the passions of its peoples both within their territory and beyond. They needed a new cultural revolution that would create a collective identity which would aggregate the best virtues from the entirety of the Far East, allowing Koreans, Vietnamese, Mongols, Thai, and all the rest to maintain their unique cultures, but also be citizens of this new nation. The ruling party knew they couldn't be the center of this new revolution. They were wise enough to know that they were an alienating aspect to the new mass of foreign citizens and young dissidents. In order to find a unifying symbol of power, the party reached into the past and restored the empire. They brought forth an emperor and seated him upon a jade throne that was reinforced through pomp and protocol drawn not just from the Chinese imperial court, but also influenced by the royal traditions of many Asian nations, a potent mythology of power that became the focal point of a new nation named Yu Jin. This mostly worked except for Japan. A majority of its citizens felt that their national pride had been sold out by greedy politicians, causing extreme tensions and terrorist attacks from the nation's island citizens until Japan eventually broke away a few decades later, forming the GSA, which is an interesting story for uh, another time. In response to China's economic hegemony, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, and Malaysia formed the Neo-Asian Alliance. And over time, more countries began flocking to this alliance in fear of China's and eventually Yu Jin's growing power. But it was only when India joined that this alliance truly became a counter to Yu Jin, its inclusion bringing the critical mass of people needed to keep pace with Yu Jin's immense population. Soon, this motley assortment of nations supplemented their economic ties with a series of mutual defense treaties, which rapidly developed into a centralized military command known as the Pan-Asian Alliance. 
and when this alliance reached across the Pacific Ocean and drew Chile and Brazil within its fold, this alliance formally organized itself into a unified nation-state, which became known as Pan-Oceana. While Eugen unified itself by looking into the past, Pan-Oceana looked towards the future. It became gripped with the Destino Tecnologico, the belief that technology was the road to the future and the destiny of mankind, and this future belonged to the nation that pursued that technology. This philosophy became the core of Pan-Oceana national identity and became the guideline for much of their foreign and domestic policy to this very day. With the slow collapse of the United States, Europe, and Russia, and the rise of Yu Jin and Pan-Oceana, it became clear who would be the global superpowers of tomorrow. Well, at least to the new superpowers. The old ones weren't inclined to let go, which led to what would be known as the Nanotech Wars. Now, while all the political stuff was happening with Pan-Oceana and Yu Jin, the United States was uh, attempting to regain its glory. Its first attempt was Project Dawn, which was a space-based project that ultimately failed. I'll uh, talk more about that in a bit. With Project Dawn a failure, they decided to dive headfirst into nanotechnology. At the time, nanotech was really coming into its own. It of course brought great advancements to many industries. But people being people, it was also used to create weapons of war. Devastator swarms, genome plagues, nanopoisons, monofilament munitions, and a bunch of other really scary stuff. As much as the United States wanted to get ahead on this new tech, they were sadly not on the cutting edge. Pan Oceana far outstripped them. They needed to do all they could to catch up, including uh, industrial espionage. And it was during an attempt by the CIA at the labs of Harris Nanoscience in Canberra that an accident occurred. An accident which resulted in a nano catastrophe with casualties in the hundreds. A scandal that escalated to a full blown conflict. And it was a long and bloody war, with a bunch of notable conflicts you should read about when you get a chance. The loss of Hawaii, the blockade of the United States west coast, fierce submarine battles in the Atlantic, not to mention an experimental nano weapon that went a little beyond its intended target and caused another nano catastrophe. This all culminated in a peace treaty that would later be known as the San Diego Truce. Although peace was established, to many this war was a sign of the end of American dominance. At least on Earth. It could be argued the American spirit continued beyond the solar system, but that's also something I'll discuss much later. Sadly, that was not the end of the horrors of nanotech, as another former superpower was trying to regain past glories. While the United States tried to regain power through tech, Russia attempted to force its way back to relevancy by creating a massive military machine. A machine that was so big that they realized a central bureaucracy was unable to directly control this massive army. To make it work, they chose to factionalize the army under largely independent generals. All they really did, though, was create provinces of brutal warlords that all happened to have nukes. And it was in several of these provinces that a cabal of American nanotech engineers many fleeing war crime tribunals, went to seek asylum. Asylum they gained in exchange for their technological knowledge. Knowledge the warlords chose to use against Yu Jin. You see, these warlords had become concerned with Yu Jin's growing power, and chose to remove this potential rival with a first strike, hoping to cripple this new nation state. And say what you will about the nanotech used by the United States in the war with Pan Oceana, at least they mostly tried to minimize civilian casualties. The Russian warlords had no such moral constraints. Although the war between Yu Jin and Russia was far briefer than the conflict between the United States and Pan Oceana, it was much more brutal and devastating, and it showed to many around the world the true horrors of nano weaponry. Despite Yu Jin's eventual victory, that war had placed a historical scar on Yu Jin, and even now, the time known as the technological sorrow is still a societal hurt. The former superpowers were not the only things losing relevancy in this new age. The decline of the USA and Europe, and the emergence of Eugene and Pan-Oceana, finally broke the by then doddering United Nations. But with its death, a new pan-national organization was formed. O12, an organization founded under the four pillars of unity, cooperation, support, and progress. Pan Oceana and Yu Jin at the time were eager to help this new global group gain some political power, probably hoping to use the organization as puppets or proxies in whatever plans they might have had. What they didn't realize 
was that O12 wasn't going to be another chess piece that the new global powers could use however they felt like. Instead, O12 was going to be a thorn in their sides for years to come. You see, the members of O12 didn't stand idly by as the world was thrown into war and uncertainty. It was O12 that was instrumental in ending the first nanotech war, getting the two sides together to sign the San Diego Truce. It was O12 who brought humanitarian aid to Eugene and Russian territories, after brutal nano and nuclear attacks. And it was O12 that the people of the world began to trust. These actions and many many more showing them, at least in the public eye, as an organization who cared more about people than nations. And after the second nanotech war, they used this trust and prestige to negotiate and ratify the Concilium Convention, a treaty governing the rules of war, with a heavy focus on which weapons nations were allowed to use in a conflict. Additionally, the convention also had wording in it about the enforcement of basic human rights. Although intended for prisoners of war, O12 later expanded it to include all people in any nation or world where humans reside, giving them the legal authority to enforce these basic human rights anywhere they believed those rights were being violated, essentially turning O12 into the de facto government of humanity. All this gave O12 far greater independence, authority, and practical strength than the fallen United Nations could have ever dreamed of, and its power they were gonna need, both on Earth and beyond. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video on the miniature war game, Infinity. A miniature war game taking place in the far future with a lot of anime inspirations, with high tech, super sci-fi, cool looking stuff. If you like it, please like, subscribe, comment, press the little bell so you know where I post, etc. So the YouTube gods know I exist and hopefully more people can see this awesome content and know more about this game. If you really like it and you're inclined and you have a little cash in your pocket, please consider sending a little money my way to my Patreon or my Ko-fi account. The extra money gives you a chance to work on these stories that I love. Anyway, thanks for listening slash watching, and uh, see you next time.